What's happening everybody? Jim here from Clockwork Industries and we're back with another video. And in this one, I'm gonna show you guys the process of taking one of these six by 12 half inch plates and turning it into one of these. And this right here is one of the production fixtures. I think this one right here is a 16 pin. And uh, I just wanted to do a little bit of content, like just kind of showing the machine working. I haven't really got much of that out since I got this machine. I've had some Instagram stories and stuff like that, but uh, <clears throat> I wanted to get a good video going over that. I'm also gonna go kind of over some of the pros and cons and just do a little bit of uh, a review on the 770M. Since the 1100MX, the order's been placed. Right now they're on back order, so I'm hoping it doesn't take too long for it to get here because they did mention that Machines are trickling in, but right now they have like a kind of a long delay, so it could be the, up to six weeks or something like that. I'm hoping it's not gonna take that long. I know I had a back ordered part before that was supposed to be six to eight weeks, and I think three weeks later, uh, a shipment came in and I was able to get it, so we'll see how it goes. Uh, but the order is in, I'm in the line to get the, one of the next ones coming in, so. Um, the first thing I'm gonna do, we'll go through kind of like the whole fixture process and I'll kind of walk through it and talk about it while I, uh, while I got a bunch of footage for it. And then uh, once I get done with that, I'll kind of go over a couple, couple of the things about the machine that uh, you know kind of reflect back on the reasons why I got it. And uh, there wasn't really many problems with it. I didn't run into anything that was too catastrophic of an issue, just some small things. So we'll go through that here uh, at the end. Um, so like going through the process of the fixture, the first thing that I got to do <clears throat> is I have the base fixture designed so I can put in two dowel pins in the back of it and then have two Mighty Bite clamps on the uh, towards like the front of it. <clears throat> Those two Mighty Bite clamps hold it in place while I do the first operation, which is surfacing the fixture flat on one side. And uh, I use the quarter inch cutter because Dealing with the tramming of the machine, like I got it as close as I could, but like if I use a fly cutter with a really big uh, surface area, uh, you could see faint lines in there. Just doing the quarter inch cutter, I knew it would be perfectly flat. So I surface the top side of it, and then uh, once that's done, I'll take the fixture plate off and I'll flip it over so that's that flat side is down on the base surface plate or on the base uh, fixture plate. And uh, once that uh, once that's in place with the Mighty Bites, uh, the first thing I do is run the uh, drill paths and that puts the four screw, screw holes in that lock the plate down. And then once, uh, once those holes are in there, I'll run a counter bore cycle. And then I use, I've really been, I've been using 632 screws to hold these in and it's been holding pretty well. So then once the counter bores are done, uh, I will go and cut the dowel pin holes. Every fixture plate will have two quarter inch dowel pin holes. That's for the alignment to get the fixture plate onto the fixture. Um, so I'll, I'll, once those are cut into the fixture plate, I'll take them, um, take the Mighty Bites out, take the dowel pins out, use the new dowel pin holes for alignment, and then use those 632 screws to clamp the fixture plate down in place. And by putting the screws in before I surface the top again, which once it's clamped down, that's the next step. Uh, it, it makes the, fixture replicate as close as it could be to flat and clamp down. A couple times I had to use the Mighty Bites again to surface the top and the flexing on the side made it bow like the tiniest bit, like half a thou. But like when I would run the first op, um, you might be able to even see it in here, but it would leave these lines when I was cutting off the uh, <clears throat> excess material. So I put the screws in and clamp it back, clamp it down how it would be in production, and then I'll surface uh, the top side. Um, once, uh, once the top side is surfaced, uh, I will run the, all the rest of the ops. So I'll cut a profile around the edge and then chamfer the profile. <clears throat> once that's chamfered, I'll flip the plate back over on the uh, on the other side and I'll run the chamfer piece again. What I do is when I run the profile pass, I leave like a few thou, like three thou, so it leaves like a little skin peel kind of thing around the edge. When I flip the plate over again, the chamfer goes and cuts that out perfectly. That way I don't gouge into the base fixture plate. Uh, I designed the system this way so I can kind of use, I never have to change it around. So like 
the base fixture lets me make the production fixtures and then I can bolt the production fixtures right into the same system and run production. And then I have sub fixtures that I've made that replicate the base fixture so I can also throw that fixture on to make other parts and prep other materials like for the panel combs. So um, that's getting it down to the base um, production fixture. Uh, all the features of the fixture itself are in there. And sometimes what I'll do is I'll prep up a bunch of fixture plates this way. Um, and then w once the final chamfer is done, then I have a raw fixture plate that I can then assign to any of the production parts because there's 18 different parts. Actually now there's almost 30 different uh, sizes and parts total that can run off of this exact fixture plate layout. So it could end up, be, end up wind up being a panel comb fixture, a rake or knuckle comb fixture. And uh, once, so once I have that done, I start the process of creating the fixture for what it's supposed to be. So this one's gonna be a 16 pin, I think. Uh, I do the engraving that gives me the uh, label on there so we know what we're looking at when we're grabbing fixture plates and stuff because I can tell but like actually having PD here and stuff and sometimes it's nice to just know so I don't have to deal with like trying to figure out what the screw hole patterns are and stuff like that. Then all the, the holes are drilled for uh, the 16 pin orientation of the combs. These are all the, the screws that hold the combs in place for the final operation to cut them out in production and then they're thread milled to uh, 632. Now some of the combs are actually done to 440 and uh, there's a couple other different thread sizes that we run but the primary ones right now oh, and then one of them is 540 as well so 632, 440, or uh, wait 440, 540 or 632 are the common sizes. So that's basically the whole process of making one of the fixtures for production and it's gonna change a little bit in the second stage once the base, base fixtures, the main fixture of it's done and it gets turned into its dedicated thing. So uh, yeah, I just kind of wanted to go through that process. I thought it would uh, make for something good in the video, especially as I get to talking about kind of the machine. So when I decided to go with the Tormach 770M, uh, I was very limited financially and I, it was the first thing I was actually able to get approved for for financing. Uh, what kind of screwed me was I needed to get a bigger down payment than I had anticipated, so it took me a while to kind of get going with the machine because I was kind of using it like I did on the router where I was using spoil boards to make parts and stuff because a lot of my budget got ate up for the fixture system. I was initially supposed to make this fixture system like immediately, which is what I'll be able to do with the new Tormach once it gets here. Is it's basically, I'll have the designs ready to go. I could even cut some parts on this one if I need to, once that one's partially set up and everything. So it's gonna be nice to have two machines to work off each other. Uh, so I went with the 770M because it runs off a 120 outlet. Uh, it has a smaller footprint. I realized on the router, I'm cutting most of the stuff I'm doing, started gearing towards production and I was using only you know, a six by 12 sheet. That's what I was cutting all the combs on, on the router, because it was more accurate. If I kept, if I kept things in a smaller area, there was less, you know, inaccuracies to deal with. So I realized, well, I don't need to wait and save up and get a mill with a huge work area. And going with the 1100 at the time, they didn't have the MX. So the MX version has a 10,000 RPM spindle on the 1100. The other one, uh, the M and the regular Tormox, the series three, they only have a 7,500 RPM spindle. I think that's only 6,000. The M series is 7,500 and then the now MX is 10,000. So I use primarily smaller cutters. Like the biggest cutter I use is the quarter inch cutter for panel combs. Everything else is a uh, 3 seconds end mill, a 5 seconds end mill. So I don't use very big cutters, so I need the higher RPM. The 778M had a 10,000 RPM spindle. So that really was, those, those were the primary things. The footprint, 120 volt, uh, and the spindle and you know of course all the, the pluses from going from a, an open router that I had to babysit the whole time going over to flood coolant where I can hit the program run close the door it's going to be even better now with the tool changer in the fourth axis where we'll be able to set up multiple stages of G code multiple G code programs have it change tools and come back to where this machine, the new machine's gonna be doing all the setups and the fourth axis stuff, and then this machine's just gonna be cutting parts out the whole time. So the real only issues that I ran into with the machine is seems to be common among all of them. No, no big problems or anything like that. It was uh, leaking in the base, 
and I think it had to do more with like weldments inside under the pan, under the chip pan that you really can't get to because, when, and I had heard about this from other people, so what I did is when I assembled the whole thing, I caulked all the seams. I really don't deal with any leaks that are like pouring out anywhere. I, I managed to get all those sealed up. It will drip out by the feet a little bit, uh, by the weldments, but it's, it's only after running long hours the whole day. Like if, I'm, if I got a good 10 hour day and the machine's been running all day, it'll start dripping out by the feet a little bit, but it's just quick to wipe up. Uh, the one main leak was through the sight glass, but they ended up changing uh, their vendor and it's a much better, higher quality sight glass now. It's a solid piece of polycarbonate now. It used to be this more like tube graduated cylinder looking thing. And that one just kept cracking. I think I had I don't know if I had, no, I had two of those ones, both of them leaked, and the, this newest one, I haven't had a single drip come out of it yet. So the only other issues I think I ran into was the solid state died, and I think I'm chalking that up to a fluke of computer parts just going bad. I mean, that kind of stuff happens. It's nothing you can really predict. The one time, and it probably was because of a power outage here, the VFD, something tripped on the VFD and it reset the VFD. So I had to get on the phone with tech support and he walked me through it. But like every problem I've had, uh, other than the sight glass having to wait on shipping, we've had it fixed in 24 hours. And other than that, I mean, things been holding tolerance of a couple thou. You know, if you can really get it under a thou, if you are really careful on your measurements of your thickness of your um, end mills and making sure everything is plugged in perfectly and calibrated all your coat and then you can tweak it with tool wear and you could really get in under a under a thou in accuracy uh that's going to take that's going to it's once you get to like a couple thou it can handle on its own and then you can get under that with your own skill and proficiency with the you know programming software and stuff like that. So I've been using the Fusion 360 for everything. I have the basic license. It's handled everything I need to do and it should handle even everything I need to do with the fourth axis because I will have some parts that can take advantage of the fourth axis, specifically as a fourth axis toolpath, but primarily it's just gonna be about, you know, being able to machine both sides of the production sheet. And really it's only gonna, it's only about chamfering. So it's, it can do all the cutting from the top, spin the production fixture over and chamfer all the holes on the bottom then it'll come off of there it'll drop on the dowel pins onto the fixtures that i have now and then go into this machine and get cut out so by doing all the tool changing on its own and getting all the process done we don't have to get in there manually and flip the sheet right now we have to do like all the top of the sheet and then flip it on dowel pins and do the back of the sheet and then then bolt it down and do the cutout. so it's going to eliminate a lot of manual input steps so it should really not only double our output, it should be more than double at the end of the day, cutting out all the manual labor involved. And like, you know, sometimes a machine will run a six minute tool path. You won't, you won't catch it for another five minutes because you're working on something else. So all that, all those little five minute times, the, all that adds up. We should see a lot of improved productivity out of that. So I'm really excited to get the new uh, 1100 MX in here. I think that's kind of all I had written down here. So. I mean, overall, it exceeded my expectations because I had my expectations set correctly. That you're not, you should. I don't know where these people get these outrageous ideas that they're, they're, they're getting. It's they. It's like they expect, or or they seem like they're getting a deal on a hundred thousand dollar machine for fifteen grand. Like, no, you're getting a fifteen thousand dollar machine for fifteen grand. Uh, it definitely is valued correctly. Uh, the way I looked at it too is like you don't have. You know, you're not getting concierge service. It's not like you're not spending over six figures where a tech's gonna come out for the first couple of years and fix whatever happens for you. Um, I expect, you know, I built my own machines when I first started all this because I bootstrapped this whole company. I've, I've built it from the ground up with no credit, no capital, no investments, nobody to help me out with big financial sums of money or anything like that. The only way I was able to grow this business was getting a sale and then, you know, outselling the expenses that I had. So that's how everything has managed to grow. And over the last two years, it's really uh, getting the Tormog, I've really been able to push the limits of what I've been able to do. So when you see this, see my company grow, at least we're fine, finally getting to the point where I've been able to build credit because I've had more sales than I've had expenses. And in those margins, I've been able to build my credit up. You know, when you when you only have these small margins to deal with, you got to bootstrap and make make do with everything that you have, everything you have available. So when you have more time than you do money and credit, you invest in yourself. And I had to figure out how to do all these things. So 
Uh, I had built all my own machines. I knew when I was getting this Tormach that if something went wrong, I'm gonna figure out how to fix it. They have tons of stuff in their troubleshooting guide and I have a feeling that there, you know, I'd see that there's a lot of new people, new to machining getting Tormox, which they do advertise to that demographic. So they're, they're fielding a ton of questions from people that, you know, their tech support is not here to show you how to export a file from Fusion 360. There's endless YouTube videos on how to do that stuff. So I think they're getting bombarded with a bunch of other things that puts their tech support behind fielding all these questions. So sometimes other people's questions and stuff like that gets you know lost in the mix. I, I knew that when I got this, my expectations were that I was ordering a machine, but everything from there once it got here was DIY. I was gonna have to figure out how to do it and figure out how to fix it and maintain it. And I had that uh, skill set from building my first, you know, I built a laser, I built a router, I assembled and calibrated and programmed my 3D printers. I'm really glad I was able to bootstrap and do that because it taught me so many things about maintaining the machines and uh, understanding how they work. And it, it's just been invaluable for me uh, bootstrapping and it would be valuable to anybody else. So I do advise that, like especially for people that are just starting off, you don't need to jump into a Tormach yet. If, unless you have the funds where, and a job that you can pay for it and it's no big deal and you can afford to learn on that level of machine. But you can just as easily learn on a thousand dollar X-Carve or a couple thousand dollar Avid machine. And even on a 3D printer, getting the very little, you know, the very basics of it and G-code and stuff like that. And a little bit of programming and stuff like that and assembly and calibration. And then taking it into the router and learning how to set, you know, calibrate the motors for steps and uh, all that kind of stuff. So it, all those skills add up. So. If you don't have the credit, you don't have the capital, but you have the time, spend that time learning. Tormach definitely met and exceeded my expectations, and I'm really looking forward to getting the new one. Uh, I think it's really gonna help us grow to that next level. And well, by the end of this year, I would like to have the Trotec laser in here, and I think we'd be pr pretty well-rounded going deep into next year, and then later in, later in the year, maybe in the spring, end of next spring or early summer, looking to get the first industrial machine, depending on Depending on the direction things go, you know, what products we get into and where, you know, I have new products that are gonna be coming out and the new machine's gonna let us get that done. We'll see where things take us. I don't like making those kind of predictions because things can change and go off in a different direction. You know, I started doing everything I'm doing right now by taking custom orders and I haven't taken a custom order in two years. I don't really have the time to do it. I, the time it takes to sit down and quote out an order, I need to focus on production, so. With PD doing production now, I've been keeping that going, but I don't have the, you know, equipment to take on custom orders. So maybe by the time I get industrial equipment where, where we can get production done really quickly, have everything stocked up, inventory built, then I have this other time. But I don't know if that's even advantageous for me where we might just start going into other products and other markets. So I don't know if custom orders will even be back on the table for sure, but uh, maybe a customized version of certain products that we can build something on the website to be able to do that. But we'll see how it goes for there. But. Uh, yeah, I don't know, I've been rambling on too long anyway. I wanted to try to keep these videos a little shorter, but if I can keep them at least under 20 minutes for now, that's good. But, or let me know do you, if you guys like the longer videos or if you like quick 10, 10 minute videos or whatever. But I had a couple other videos planned. I just got this workstation laptop. I was maybe thinking about doing a video on that and I had something else planned, but I can't quite remember what it is right now. But either way, that's gonna wrap up this one. Thank you guys for watching. I do want, oh, that's what it is more modding content. I'm gonna be working on this Cooler Master uh, Pro 6 case here. I wanna get a build that has a bunch of our products in it, like uh, the door panels, uh, the you know, knuckle combs, probably some rake combs, panel combs. I wanna get all of them inside of a build and have like a nice build so if I do have a new product, I can change all the products in there and do photos and get them on the website and stuff like that. Um, Speaking of social media and the website, if uh, you're using your pro uh, clock, any Clockwork Industries products, Uncle Combs, Ray Combs, that kind of stuff, and you're sharing on Instagram, tag me and uh, tag Clockwork Industries in a post and I'll repost it on my site to share your work out to more people. Um, and yeah, so possibly a video on the laptop, but definitely coming up is more modding videos. So I'm gonna get kind of back into it with the Pro 6 and getting like a build done with a bunch of the Clockwork products in it. And then I'm gonna start on I have a media PC I need to build out here that'll be for us for our pod, watching podcasts and listening to music and stuff like that, as well as printing shipping labels. And then I'm moving most of my design work and like actual heavy lifting stuff to a workstation build that's gonna be in the office. So I'm gonna do the workstation build. So I definitely have, I'm gonna have a couple modding projects that I'm really excited to finally get back into and make some video content for that too. So uh, 
Thank you guys for watching. Like, subscribe, share, and uh, yeah, thanks. I'll see you in the next video. Later.